Thank you. Um, I would like to thank uh, Partha Dasgupta and Peter Raven for the invitation today, for the Pontifical Academies, for the opportunity to be part of this, uh, this fabulous discussion. As, as Peter said, if I can have the first slide, please. As Peter said, I was in Antarctica for the past uh, seven weeks, where I, I think about deep time. My, my research is in, in rocks that are hundreds of millions of years old, and I'm really interested in the events that happened inside the rocks you see there. And what I want to begin with is a slide, this is the camp I lived in for seven weeks, um, but really what I want to show here is an aesthetic, and that is the juxtaposition between the present and the past. And that's kind of the space I'm in as a paleontologist, but also it's something that I think touches on what we'll be doing here for the next several days. And that is what you see in Antarctica today, particularly here on the margin between the dry valleys and the, and the ice shelf itself, you know, is a desolate world. It's, uh, there's, there's really kind of nothing living except for three species of nematode and, and lots of microbes. But in terms of animals and plants that we're familiar with, this, it's, it's a barren world. Yet when you look inside the rocks, of which you see here, those, those brown and tan rocks, it's a tropical rainforest. It's a, a world thriving with life, with all kinds of different plants and animals. Um, and what we have to see in Antarctica is in the past you know, tens of millions of years, that an the continent of Antarctica shifted from one of the most thriving ecosystems on the planet, tropical rainforest that existed prior to the Eocene, to something that's utterly devoid of life in the interior. And that gives, should give us a, an aesthetic as we proceed with our work, which is really the tipping points that existed in the, in the planet in the past. That is, what is today as a barren world was once was thriving with life, and, and almost every ecosystem can be touched, and that's one of the lessons we see uh, within the rocks. So really just to begin is if we, let's see what we do here. Uh-oh, how do I switch? Oh, there we go. Let's go. Um, you know, we're used to, where do I point this thing? Do I point it up, down, sideways? Hello, can I have the next slide? Next slide. Next slide. This thing's not, there we go. <laughs> So you know, when we see, you know, when we see the biological world today, we see we see microbes, we see fungi, we see plants, we see animals of different types. Yet when we look in the rocks themselves, we see a world that. Uh oh. Could we have? I'm just going to do it verbally. Can I have the next slide? That's not the world we see everywhere, fortunately. <laughs> should, I go, should I go to them and tell? Yeah, I'm not getting. Oh, I got it. I got it. Um, if we, we look, I, I got it. I was just pushing the wrong button. That was human error. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Newsflash, push the bottom button when you uh, want to advance. Sorry, I was thinking top. I have it, thanks, I think. Yeah, I got it. Human error, I recovered. This your presentation? Yes, this is me, and I'm the first speaker, so I'm the guinea pig, and I just did it all, yeah, thanks. It's um, working. Yeah, it is, I know is now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, let me go back then. Um, anyway, so when we look in the past, we see a world of, of, of exotic beasts, of animals and plants that we have very little imagination of today. We only see them in the fossil record, and we can reconstruct them phylogenetically. You know, paleontologists have calculated that, as you read in the document, over 99% of the species that lived on the Earth for the past billions of years are now extinct. And really what we're looking at are really the twigs of evolutionary branches, some of which extend very deep in time. Now, one thing, you know, I, I, I love to show this diagram as a paleontologist um, is really showing the history of life. And I find a diagram like this deeply humbling. I know it doesn't look like much now, but it is truly deeply humbling. <clears throat> this is taken from the National Academy of Sciences report on evolution uh, from about seven years ago. And we see in a line here is the, the timeline of the history of the solar system from the formation of the sun to the formation of the earth. Current estimates of the Earth are that it's about four and over a little bit over four and a half billion years old. And the earliest sign of life, which is just to the, to the, to the right there from the, after the origin of, of the Earth, is about four billion years. In fact, it, it may be that our, the life had had multiple origins and it may have extended before four billion years. Uh, in that the, what we can record is actually earlier than that. And then what you see is this bar continues to the right with really kind of nothing visible happening. The reality is that's one of the most active periods in the history of the Earth. It's just invisible to us as fossils, yet you'll hear about it uh, a, bu a bit about that uh, tomorrow. That's the history of microbes, the history of the atmosphere, the establishment of much of the modern world through multiple feedbacks which were established during that, that period of microbial history. 
The period I'm going to be talking about is all the way to the right, where you see these expanded boxes that extend from the Cambrian to the present, essentially from the first origin of, of bodies, of, of animals and plants and fungi, to the invasion of land by plants and animals and, uh, and both vertebrates and invertebrates, and then all the way to the right to the deepest sliver of time, which is the origin of mammals and, and humanity. We like to think we're the only species that has impacted the climate uh, of the Earth, but in reality, species have been doing it throughout history. If you, if you think about it in terms of geological time, trillions of algae over billions of years had much of an impact on much of the breathable oxygen that exists on the Earth today. But what's deeply humbling about this diagram is not only are we uh, recent newcomers to this planet, being here only in a sliver of time, but we, through our activities in that short period of time, have the capacity and indeed are changing the Earth uh, in, in some very profound ways. Now, as a paleontologist, I spend a lot of time thinking about the two sort of controllers of diversity, and those are biological origins and biological extinctions. And the way we tend to visualize these things are on spindle diagrams, which you see on the left here. This is sort of a standard one. I just randomly took it of cephalopods. And what you see in these, these black diagrams are diversity diagrams. And you can see in each of these, these are species or genera of, of cephalopod. You can see they have an origin where the black line begins, and they get wider. And then you'll notice that they shrink. These are plotted over time. So what you see are the ranges of these cephalopod genera over geological time. And the width of those spindles corresponds to their diversity. And the obvious thing that should strike you is each one of those genera has an origin. And each one of those uh, genera has an extinction. And they have a period where they increase in diversity. And it's really this balance between the origination rate that is the origin of these new taxa, and their extinction rate that controls uh, the diversity that we see. The underlying viewpoint as we look at this at the level of paleontology and in the history of the Earth is that origin and extinction are deeply coupled. That is, the origins of taxa can cause the extinction of other groups, and then indeed extinctions can control origins themselves. So think of these as the yin and the yang of biological diversity. So I want to talk a little bit about origins first, just for a few slides, just to give you a flavor for that, and then spend the most of my time on extinctions, understanding that origin and extinction are deeply coupled. So a little bit about origins. The first is, origins, unlike what I'm going to tell you about extinctions, tend to be predominantly very gradual. The ones I look at happen over millions, if not tens of millions of years. And one of the powerful things about being an evolutionary biologist, indeed a paleontologist, is we can predict where to find intermediates in the fossil record. Now I should say extinctions, it stands in contrast to this, and I'll tell you in a second, that much of the extinctions we're going to be talking about are not gradual, they're catastrophic, and they reveal that every ecosystem on the planet has an endpoint, uh, and furthermore, they can be somewhat unpredictable. Now to, to just touch back on origins, let me just give you a couple examples just to set the stage. On the bottom you have a whale. And on the top, you have a four-legged creature. And if you look at those two creatures just at their endpoints, they look vastly different. Whales have no hind limbs. They have a fusiform body shape. They have a blowhole. They have a specialized kind of ear. But when we layer in the fossil evidence and we start to look at the rocks of the right age and the right type to hold intermediate creatures, what we find are all kinds of intermediates that connect whales uh, to, uh, to limbed forms. And indeed, we can trace the origin of um, of blowholes, the loss of hind limbs, the origin of the fusiform body shape that's so typical of whales, we can trace each of these things gradually in the fossil record. That's what paleontologists do. Likewise, we can do it with birds. If you compare a bird to a dinosaur, they look very different in some ways, eh, similar in others. But it really wasn't until about two decades ago that people started to find feathered dinosaurs and feathered dinosaurs with proto wings and so forth that we can connect the forms of life on the planet. And what I'm showing you here is sort of the aesthetic that drives much of, of my communication in science, and that includes both an understanding of climate change and extinction as well as evolution to communities that are often opposed to it, that is telling the narratives of discovery, that is how we find these intermediates, actually has power in changing minds, changing perspectives, and conveying values, sometimes in communities that might be opposed to those values. The story I talk about is a story I work on a lot is the transition from fish to tetrapod. What you see is a, is a fish on top, a limbed animal on the bottom, the creature on top is from rocks about 390 million years ago, the creature on the bottom with limbs uh, is from rocks about 365 million years ago. If you know where to look, that is, you look for places in the world that have rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type, and rocks that are exposed to the surface, this particular ex set of expeditions took us to near the North Pole uh, in Ellesmere Island, 
You can find layers with, um, with, with fossils inside, such as uh, this one here. I know it doesn't look like much. You see two people, <laughs> and between them is a hunk of rock. Well, in that hunk of rock uh, is, a, is a fossil. We subsequently found about 20 of them of a creature like this. With a, you see it as a flat head. When we remove it from the rock, it's a cross between limbed animal and, uh, and fish. It's a creature with a flat head. That is, when if I show it to kids, okay, and I've, I've showed it to kids in elementary school, I can say, guys, what is this? And some children will say, you know, it's a crocodile. Other kids will correct them and say, no, no, it's a fish, because it has scales with, um, uh, uh, with, with fins, because you can see the fins on the bottom there. And that's just the kind of narrative we want to convey. That is, I think, and I was just struck by the discussion this morning and some of the comments this morning, how we lie at the interface uh, between um, conveying incentives for change, but also values for change. And I think to con and, and values, we cannot underestimate the importance of values in the enterprise that we're talking about. And one way I've experienced in communicating values is through narratives like this, communicating to children the narratives of discovery, the narratives of what those implications of those discoveries are, in this case, connecting all life on the planet as one giant family tree. And I think that's, they're, they're, we'd be lost if we don't convey these values in some important way. And that's why, this is, that's why I'm showing this, because this is a big part of my scientific communication. And so what we can do is we can relate fish to tetrapods, fish to limbed animals, and I can show you stories of discovery for this. But the reality is here is that this story of origins is only a small part of the history of the Earth. Much of the history of the Earth is not the origin of these taxa, but it's the extinction of other taxa. That is, the way this event happened, as well as a number of the other events that I showed you already, from whales to birds, and many that I'm not talking about, the way these groups gain traction is by the disappearance of others. And so this yin and the yang between origin and extinction is incredibly important in the biological world, and that's where I'm going to be focusing. So just to sort of review the history of life, I'm just showing the four and a half billion year history of life, a four billion year history of life as sort of a corkscrew pattern. A couple major things, just to touch base on what I've already said. You can hear some of this tomorrow. Most of the history of life, and indeed most, much of the feedbacks between life and the planet itself, happens through microbes. That's invisible to paleontologists like me. It's visible to people like uh, Tim Lenton. Um, but that is critical. So there's a whole series of extinctions and ways that genomes have evolved and the ways the biological su systems have been set up that actually originally happened first in microbes over billions of years. The next is that there are feedbacks between the Earth and the life shape evolution, not only origins, but also extinctions. Remember the example I just showed you, which is the transition from fish to limbed animal. There is no chance that that, ex that event could have happened without changes in plants first. That is the establishment of plants, land plants, which set up whole new kinds of ecosystems, which allowed our distant ancestors, limbed animals, or fi fish that evolved to walk on land, that enabled their presence. And that, was that origin of land plants was enabled by changes in microbes, changes in the, the geological structure of the Earth itself. So we have our feedbacks between life and the Earth itself. That is, plants, animals, microbes have changed the Earth multiple times, and that the changes that we see, the origins and extinctions that we see, are as a response to changes often uh, in those feedbacks, <clears throat> within the context of many of those feedbacks. So one cannot underestimate, in my um, case, the origin of land plants. Indeed, the origin of land plants is associated with the origin of soils. So having the origin of soils coupled with the origin of plants, having soils enabled the ecosystems which allowed our ancestors to uh, come about, really enable all that uh, to happen. Um, one key thing is, and this is when you study evolution, is that anatomical revolutions, the origins we see, come about from repurposing old genes, tissues, and structures from new, for new uses. Fingers, toes, feathers, all the major innovations we see in the fossil record actually happened first in distant ancestors living in other environments. Lunged creatures originally rose in aquatic systems, in water, not on land. So the shift from life in water to life on land didn't necessarily involve the origin of lungs and the origin of fingers and the origin of new organs. Those things already existed in fish for tens of millions of years before. What changed was the operative environment that those creatures lived in. The anatomical inventions already existed. What happened to, to spur the transition from life in water to life on land was one, environmental change, uh, associated with new, new climate, new atmosphere, and so forth, and two, extinction, the removal of other competitors, and so forth. Finally, and this is the last bullet point here, really one of the main drivers of change on life on our planet, uh, indeed one of the dominant ones, is extinction. Extinction has shaped the course uh, of evolution. So I'm going to spend the bulk of my talk on that, and what you see here 
is a slide of extinction. This is a Devonian ecosystem. On the left is that crazy creature I showed you before with the fins and the limbs. You can see it all the way on the left there. But it lived in a world that would be unfamiliar to us today, largely because there are all kinds of other creatures that are now extinct um, uh, in that ecosystem. And there's really the removal of those creatures that's coupled with the rise of many lineages, including our own land living, uh, land -living creatures. So just to set the stage uh, with extinction, at least extinction uh, in deep time, a couple points that I want to talk about is extinction was really only discovered, I mean, it was talked about by, by many people over many centuries, but it was really only discovered as a scientific area of inquiry in the last 150 years, maybe a little bit more, and there are several major types. It's hard to talk about extinction without talking about Baron Cuvier. Baron Cuvier at the Natural History Museum of Paris was fortunate to be alive at a time when expeditions were coming from around the world with all kinds of new and bizarre animals. In, the case of, in this case, giant ground sloths, uh, as well as mammoths. Now at the time, in Baron Cuvier's time, there were multiple ways to interpret this. One can interpret these things in sort of, as sort of uh, Loch Ness monsters, that is, perhaps they were still alive in some remote corner of the world. Or, as Cuvier did, taking a real intellectual leap, which is maybe these represent creatures that once lived on the Earth but are no longer, and hence the concept of extinction. Now, Cuvier pushed this point importantly in a couple ways. He pushed this point in saying that, number one, extinction is a major sort of sculptor of, of life on the planet, and number two, that, that this is these extinctions, and this was a leap on his part, which turned out to be quite bold, was that these extinctions are catastrophic. He had a catastrophist view of Earth history that it wasn't this gradualistic sort of Darwinian view of change, of even progress, but that the Earth was punctuated by uh, pre-Diluvian uh, catastrophes. This theme was picked up by a, a British a geologist at Oxford, John Phillips. John Phillips really sort of was, was following in the footsteps of one of, his, uh, one of his relatives in using geological maps to, to find fossils, but then put those fossils in a geological series. And as John Phillips did that, he saw something that's really important for us today, even in this conference, and that is that the pulses in the history of life consisted of a series of faunas. Yeah, sorry, no floras, because he wasn't interested in plants, of animals. Um, that there was a, a, an ancient fauna, which you can see on the bottom. You can see the trilobites there. There was a middle fauna that had sort of uh, mollusks and brachiopods. I just put uh, dinosaurs there, because they're make for a better slide in the morning. And then on the top, uh, there was a, a fauna defined by, uh, by, uh, by more recent creatures. And he saw these three faunas, and he defined the terms um, Mesozoic, uh, Paleozoic, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. But importantly, what John Phillips saw was much like Cuvier, is that there are sharp breaks between these faunas. Okay, that there wasn't a continuous progress uh, all the way through the history of life, that there are origins and extinctions, and indeed those extinctions punctuated these great geological, uh, great geological eras. Now since Phillips' time, obviously, people have collected a lot of fossils, people have done taxonomy on those fossils, and have done major databases of plotting geological time versus diversity. That is asking the question, how has the diversity of animal life changed over geological time? And if you look in the geological, if you look in the literature, uh, you'll see diagrams like this. And what you'll see is this is produced by, <coughs> excuse me, this is produced by my colleague, at, uh, deceased colleague at Chicago, uh, Jack Sapkowski. What Jack did, this is back in the in the 1980s, is he plotted the number of families seen in the fossil record over geological time. And you can see he, the, the axis goes essentially from Precambrian to the tertiary, from about 600 million years ago to the present. And he's plotted the number of families. And if you plot the number of these taxa, you could do this for families, you could do this for genera as well. You see the gen same general pattern. That is, what you see is a general rise in diversity from, the, from about 600 million years ago, all the way up to a peak uh, at about 450, 500 million years ago. And then you see it hits a plateau, and then it drops a few times. You can see there are several drops in diversity, end Ordovician, late Devonian, and Permian, and Triassic, and end Cretaceous. What this shows is that there's been a, a rise in diversity, but occasionally in the history of life, there's been a resetting. And what you're seeing here are the so-called big five uh, mass extinctions. 
I should notice, I should, I should point out that these, these extinctions can be often very dramatic, and then we're going to talk a little bit about them, and they can really reset the clock. So if you look, for instance, at that end Permian extinction of about 230 million years ago, you can see that's a pretty dramatic drop. But each of these are, are quite dramatic drops in the diversity of life on the planet. And it's not just in terms of number of taxa. It's in almost every way you want to measure what's happened to the Earth. These things are very, very large. And if you look at this, if you, if you plot extinction rate uh, over the same time frame, what you see is there's sort of a general, it's shown in green, background level of extinction. Extinction is a regular process in the history of life, but there are certain events that in extinction rate just pop high. These are the five big extinctions, and you see that they, uh, these mass extinctions, there are five in number, uh, uh, are, are quite dramatic. What's dramatic about them is not only the, so the extinction rate, not only the percentage of, of groups that are affected, but the fact that these things are global, they affect the entire planet, that they affect almost all ecosystems, indeed, uh, these, each of these the big ones have affected all ecosystems, and indeed, they reset the biosphere. That is, the world is never the same after these. That is, some groups are gone, and other groups have proliferated, but the world is not the same. And if you just look at numbers, just getting back to numbers again, each of these, these are the big five right here. This is just plotting out when they happened with how you know, dramatic they are. Just look at these are plots. These are just numbers of the percentages of genera or families or species that went extinct. You could see like Ordovician Silurian, that top one there, 57% of species died out. The late Devonian one, 70% of known species died out. In the end, Permian, 96% of marine species died out. The Permian-Triassic extinction is called the extinction where life almost died. Um, that's mostly true on the water, not necessarily on land. It was only 70% only of uh, land species were affected. Um, and at the bottom one, of course, is the famous Cretaceous tertiary extinction where dinosaurs and marine reptiles and so forth uh, died out. And that's what I'm going to focus on now. I want to focus on the end Cretaceous event because there's a lot of um, paleontological research done on these. I think that speaks to some of the work that we'll be doing over the next, the next couple days. Now, as I said, the end Cretaceous event, just like all the other big five extinctions, affected multiple species globally around, uh, around the world, but also every ecosystem. It affected the land, that is famous, famously the dinosaurs, the air, famously the pterosaurs, and the marine realm, famously the marine reptiles, uh, as well as marine invertebrates such as ammonites. All these things had their demise at the, at the end of the Cretaceous about uh, 65 million years ago. <clears throat> now, it's very hard to study an extinction event like this using dinosaurs, because dinosaurs tend to be rare, they tend to be monospecific, uh, they tend to be hard to get any numbers on. If you look at the, the sort of the prime tax that people use to understand the dynamics of extinction, and importantly ask questions about, you know, what controls the survivorship of mass extinction and so forth, um, the main sort of workhorse model system uh, have been marine bivalves. Now, marine bivalves were hit very hard at the end of the uh, Cretaceous. Um, but they have several virtues which uh, have provided uh, an entree to understand sort of mechanisms of mass extinction, and importantly, mechanisms of recovery from mass extinction, that is what happens afterwards. The first of these things, you know, they're, they're very diverse. Uh, there are over 3,000 genera of marine, uh, marine bivalve. They're incredibly abundant. You can go to certain layers and find hundreds of them in, you know, a single rock the size of a small, uh, a small football. Um, they have multiple uh, and diverse life habits and life histories and they exist uh, fairly globally, and they exist in all depths and, and latitudes uh, throughout the Cretaceous. <clears throat> but they're also affected by the extinction event. So what they allow is really sort of, you can ask the question, you know, what are the characteristics that are, are increase risk of going extinct? Or conversely, what are the characteristics that buffer a taxon from, being, from going extinct? But, uh, so survival during normal times. So remember I told you there are two types of extinctions. There's so-called sort of continual background rate of extinction, and then there are these big five that are the so-called mass extinctions. You know, if you, look at, if you look at background times, there are a number of features which sort of control or are related to the susceptibility or extinction risk. That is local abundance, um, reproductive mode, body size, trophic strategy, life position, and species richness, each of these traits, when you bore down in detail on them, can, can be predictors of extinction risk or the ability, or extinction risk uh, very broadly. That's not where I'm going, because the background extinctions, those are, have a predictable sort of quality to them. You can ask the question is, what 
you know, these big five, which have really sculpted much of the, uh, much of the biosphere that we see, um, you can ask the question, what are the features related to survival during mass extinction, or what increase um, extinction risk? And we can go back to our list, and you can ask the question of statistically, in, at least in marine bivalves, which of these matter, and none of them do. Okay, none of these are predictors of extinction risk in during mass extinction. Something else uh, is happening, both quantitatively and qualitatively, uh, during these times. It turns out that my colleague Dave Jablonski at, um, at the University of Chicago has been looking at this for some time, and I cribbed this uh, slide from David this week before I came. It turns out if you look at, ask, and again, revisit this question and ask, you know, what's the trait or traits that matter, it turns out geographic range, that is, ha the number of provinces that a, that a genus has, so a genus contains species, if a genus has species that exist in multiple provinces, the extinction intensity is much lower. So the general take home message is, broader geographic range corresponds to less extinction. That seems to be the only trait that matters so far that people have studied um, that, uh, that are related to extinction risk. And indeed, <coughs> this is not just true for marine bivalves, it's true for other cre creatures as well, but it's also true not just in the end Cretaceous event, but it's also true uh, in each of the big five, from the end Ordovician to the late Devonian and Permian and so forth. That is geographic range, the broader the geographic range, um, the, uh, the, the greater the survivability uh, of mass extinctions. What's interesting here is that the characteristic of broad geographic range is itself dependent on lots of different biological features of, of, of organisms. And it turns out that if creatures with broad geographic range that may preferentially survive these mass extinctions, may, um, it lends an unpredictability to the evolution. That is, some, 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 some traits may persist in the fossil record because they're indirectly related to broad geographic range, and conversely, some traits may disappear from the fossil record and go extinct at these mass extinctions because they're correlated to a narrow geographic range. So in examples of the latter are the rudest uh, hinge form. It's a particular type of hinge form that exists in bivalve mollusks. It turns out though creatures that have the rudest hinge form, this particular type of hinge in the bivalve shell, um, preferentially go extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. Moreover, these taxa preferentially have narrow geographic ranges. So there are some features that are coincidentally related to geographic range that themselves are affected by mass extinctions, not because they're better adapted or worse adapted, but because they're indirectly related to this one feature that really matters in mass extinctions. And indeed, if we look at the fossil record, we see the rudest hinge form, the trigonid hinge form, um, complex sutures and cephalopods, complex colonies and Paleozoic bryozoans, all these features that disappear in the fossil record are indirectly related to, they were, because they were carried by taxa that had narrow geographic ranges, they disappear from the fossil record. So the take home message is that when we look at mass extinctions, the survivors may or may not be better adapted in a particular way. It is they have features that are coincidentally correlated to survivorship, in this case, um, broad, um, broad um, geographic range. So when we deal with these uh, events, and we now consider catastrophes to be real events in the fossil record, this is actually a shift from Darwin. Darwin had a very gradualistic view of change, a, a, a view of change where not only was change gradualistic, but it was based on progress, on competition uh, between creatures. What we now are coming to grips with in the last two, two, three decades in paleontology is the sense that catastrophes, particularly the five big ones, are major events in the history of life, that they reset the clock in many ways, and they carry with them a certain unpredictability. That is, organisms may adapt in certain ways prior to the catastrophe, um, and that those, those traits that they evolved may be irrelevant to their survivorship. Regardless, we are dealing with a world at the end of the Cretaceous, uh, at, after the Permo-Triassic extinction event where 96% of the species die out. We're dealing with a world depopulated in species. And so it's a useful question to ask is, how does the Earth recover from catastrophes? What happens? Are there lessons to be learned from, from that recovery? One of the best study one is the Permo-Triassic uh, extinction event. This is that event over 240 million years ago, 230 million years ago, uh, where 96% um, of species died out. Turns out the recovery from the Permo-Triassic event, uh, which nearly destroyed life in the seas entirely, took a long time, took over 10 million years. 
And I know that diagram to the right doesn't really look like much, but actually that shows sort of a general pattern of the recovery of these ecosystems over time. In general, what you see in the upper left is you see a block there, those are Permian rocks, and on the top you see lots of creatures. That's like the pre-catastrophe uh, fauna. Once the catastrophe hits, really you see a, a fossil record, a series of rocks mostly devoid of fossil life. There's, I'm sure there's tons of microbial life that we're not seeing. And then as you proceed to the right on the top three blocks, the first recovery fauna are very high abundance but low diversity rocks. So you go from a world at the end of the Permian where you have sort of low abundance of fossils but very high diversity to a post-extinction sort of, sort of, fauna after it sort of picks up after a few million years, a very high abundance of creatures, but very low diversity. So the world is filled by lots of critters, but those critters are very low diversity. And it's really over time in the bottom three blocks where you see the origin of trophic structures. That is, these recoveries are such that weedy species are the first um, responders, and it may be weedy species that evolved right after the extinction event, or weedy species that for whatever reason survived the extinction, but weedy species that are invasive, that reproduce rapidly, um, that are fairly robust in terms of their life histories to environmental change, that those are the creatures that sort of are abundant very quickly. And it's really only later, over tens of millions of years, that the higher trophic levels, um, carnivores and so forth, come back. And they do so unpredictably. I showed this slide of a giant bird eating a mammal to remind myself to say, that at the end Cretaceous event, when the dinosaurs were removed, you removed the largest predators on the earth, the largest carnivores, the dinosaurs. The first large predators to fill that niche were not large mammals, which we think about today, but large birds 10 feet tall, like giant terror birds like this one. So the origin, so the origin of trophic structures uh, happens, of, of sort of trophic complexity, happens over uh, tens of millions of years, but the players may shift over time. So it shifted in this case after the end of the Cretaceous uh, from large dinosaurs to, to large birds, but then later to what we're familiar with today, uh, large mammals. Finally, the survivors aren't necessarily the best adapted to the local environment. I think this is one of the biggest messages of catastrophe of, um, of, uh, of the five big mass extinctions, that is you really can't predict based on their biological adaptations who would survive the extinction event necessarily. It's really survivorship depends on features that are only indirectly related to prior uh, adaptations. So causes. Now this is something that, you know, we're all familiar with. Some of these causes, I just, it's, it just sort of helps to sort of touch base on this again. This is a very famous diagram. This is Luis and Walter Alvarez. Uh, Walter has his hand on a white band there. Uh, that white band is the, Cretaceous, is the zone where the Cretaceous tertiary extinction happened. That, so basically where Walter's hand is, is at the end of the Cretaceous. And his father, Luis, on the left, his hand uh, is on the tertiary. And you can actually identify a single layer where the KT extinction happened about 65 million years ago. As many of you well know, Luis uh, and Walter proposed the asteroid impact theory, the notion that a giant asteroid hit the Earth, um, and then it caused the extinction, uh, caused the changes, collapse of global ecosystems, which caused then uh, major mass extinctions of the and Cretaceous. This was a very, very um, important hypothesis in a lot of ways, and not just because of the asteroid, because it changed thinking, and it changed thinking that's relative, re relevant to our work over the next few days. That is, they made a prediction, of course. They made a prediction that the, you know, this asteroid hit the Earth, and famously, as I'm sure you all well know, that they made a geochemical set of predictions, too, that there should be a spike in the, in the rock record of, of iridium and other uh, shock quartz and other minerals at the Cretaceous tertiary event indicative of a bolide uh, impact. <clears throat> What's relevant um, about this hypothesis is not only the asteroid impact hypothesis itself, but is a change in thinking from a gradualistic mode, that is, extinction as an outgrowth of day-to-day -day competition and progress and adaptation among species, to a catastrophist mode, to one where there are periodic shocks to ecosystems around the world that happen for reasons random to adaptation bef evolution beforehand, but they happen and reset the clock. And since that time, and well, for, since Cuvier's time actually, but since more aggressively since the Alvarez time, a number of causes have been proposed, external causes have been proposed for mass extinctions, range from glaciation and changes in, 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 Earth, uh, in Earth climate, ocean chemistry from anoxia of the oceans to hyperacidity uh, of the oceans, volcanism, asteroid, and tectonics. I list these to say that is, you know, we've, we've seen a shift in multiple ways, shift in one way from a gradualistic thought to catastrophist, 
Um, and the other is that each of these causes really feeds into the feedbacks that exist between life uh, and the, the, between the biosphere and the geosphere. That is, changes to ocean chemistry affect life, life affects the geosphere, and so these, it's wrong to think about extinctions necessarily as an external cause. There may be an external trigger, but it's the way the Earth responds to those through changes in its feedback loops, which you'll hear about from Tim Lenton tomorrow, um, that, really, that, that really relate to the changes in diversity that we see. So lessons from the past, I want to close with a few things for topics for discussion. Remember, one thing as a paleontologist, what I'm dealing with is a world without people. I'm dealing with feedbacks in a world without people. We're dealing with species in a world without people. So what's the baseline? So one thing paleontological data can do is allow us to ask the question, what is the world like before humans? What are the baselines for diversity as we begin to interpret human impacts? Now, one of the key things to think about is that I'm working on deep time. My rocks are 385, 375 million years old, but there are fossil records that exist for assemblages that are hundreds of years old, thousands of years old. And it's these can, that can provide the baselines for understanding changes in marine systems, changes in, in fluvial systems around the world. Let me give you one example. The Colorado River in the United States. We have played with the Colorado River, diverted the Colorado River, messed with the Colorado River for, 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 for water supplies in Southern California um, for the last hundred years. Colleagues in Arizona have looked at the fossil records in the Gulf of California, which is where the, um, where the Colorado feeds into. If you look at the recent, you look at the fossil records that existed in rocks or in soils and rocks from about 1,000 years ago to about 150 years ago, before the diversion of the Colorado River, and compare them to what we see in the faunas today, one thing we see is dramatic changes in the communities of, Gulf, of the Gulf of California. And here's a case where paleontological data, particularly more recent paleontological data, gives us a sense of baselines and how, ba how, how baselines themselves are changing. In this case, what we're seeing is the extinction of bivalves present in the fossil record, and also the changes in multiple growth rates of fish. So the diversion of the Colorado River has itself changed marine ecosystems and done so in ways uh, that have caused the extinction of some creatures and the changes in growth rates of others. I'm showing you this point not only to show that the diversion of the Colorado, Colorado River has had major impact, but that the importance of understanding a, the baselines of a world before humans and what is relevant to our, our, the work here in terms of thinking about uh, our impact, our, our, the, the, the impact of human behavior on uh, animal diversity. The next is uh, the lessons from the past are understanding which traits confer extinction susceptibility and risk in the face of climate change. Again, remember we talk about two different kinds of extinction events, the background extinction events, which are the, the regular ones that happen as a result of animals interacting with their environment, and then the other is the periodic catastrophes, the five, the five great extinctions. And again, that there is differences uh, between those two types of extinction in the types of uh, traits that confer extinction risk. The next is, uh, and importantly, is that the victims of mass extinctions, the catastrophic mass extinctions, were often well adapted to their environment, right? So an understanding of how adaptation happened prior to the mass extinction does not lend a predictability necessarily to understanding how they're going to be affected by an asteroid impact or major changes to ocean chemistry and so forth. And finally, and this is really important, and this is something that paleontological data for the last, you know, four billion years shows is that every ecosystem has a breaking point. Every ecosystem can change and can change catastrophically. Thank you very much.